Hello, everyone. Welcome to the recording of my presentation at the 76th International Conference of the Society of Architectural Historians, which took place on April the 13th, 2023, in Montreal, Canada. Dear colleagues, let me express my gratitude and excitement for being part of this marvelous panel, which aims for nothing less than to contribute to deconstructing the myth of a modernist architect. Architectural history has constructed the myth of that, uh, the myth that a modern architect is an isolated genius who comes up with his original inventions ex nihilo in solitude. And when those inventions are presented publicly, the world either rewards them with eternal fame and glory or more often treats them with misapprehension and rejection. However, as we all know from historical research, architecture, probably the most out of all the creative fields, relies on the cooperation and the collaborative efforts of individuals, institutions, and infrastructures. The distinction between the creative input that deserves to be rewarded with our attention and the input, uh, which is only technical, mechanical, or manual, and therefore deserves to be forgotten, is artificial and to some extent absurd. We often tend to imagine the social structure around great architects as an atom where all particles orbit and gravitate towards the center, when it was in reality rather, rather a network that was interconnected and mutually beneficial. If you want to discuss the deconstruction of a myth of a modern architect, Three figures usually cannot be left out, Mies, Le Corbusier, and Frank Lloyd Wright. And I'm glad that we will hear about all three of them today. And I'm also glad that I can represent the Wrightian bit today. In my paper, I would like to achieve two goals. Based on various previous research on Kolivka and Wright, I would like to correct a little the idea of a meeting of the minds and a harmonious collaborations of two geniuses. Secondly, I would like to bring other figures to attention and show a new professional and social network that arose uh, around these two and their collaboration. The method I used was archival research in the rediscovered archive papers of Yaroslav Polivka, which was in a private estate. And in 2021, I helped to digitize this archive, which was subsequently divided to become part of various public collections. Respected researchers, such as Barry Muscat, Diego Martin Saiz, Paul Venable Turner, and Barry Bergdahl, who dealt with the collaboration of Polivka and Wright in the past two decades, based their research mostly on Polivka's papers at the library of the University at Buffalo. This archival fund was created in 1983, when Polivka's wife passed away and his children offered the entire archive consisting of almost 20 boxes to various archives, including the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation in Scottsdale, Arizona. For various reasons, all archives surprisingly turned down the offer. Only the University at Buffalo accepted just two boxes of papers and two boxes of photographs, which were strictly tied to Frank Lloyd Wright, or at least mentioning his name. The rest of Polivka's papers were hidden in his grandson's attic until 2017. This is very important because the selection and the separation of the archive sets up the entire discourse on Polivka in, in recent architectural history. He was regarded as Wright's engineer who helped design the organic. As my research shows, the relationship of the two was not as harmonious and as presented previously and Polivka was so much more than just Wright's little helper. He was capable of his own original creations, reflecting other inventions of contemporary architecture, such as those of Richard Neutra or the Eichler homes, or generally the mid-century modernism in California. In addition, more people brought to Wright's attention by Polivka became involved in their creative process. I would like to show the nature of their collaboration and input of other silent collaborators. Using examples of three joint projects, the Butterfly Bay Bridge in San Francisco Bay, 
the Mile High Building in Illinois, Belmont Racetrack Pavilion in New York City, and one project designed by Polivka and Wright's Fellows, the Midland House in Redwood City, California. I would like to illustrate Polivka's and Wright's rather bumpy relationship and shed light on other actors who became inventors of some of the significant features of these projects. Let me first briefly introduce Polivka's personal and professional background. Jaroslav Polivka was born in Prague. Uh, right before the World War I, he moved to Switzerland for a couple of years, then to Vienna, and then at the end of World War I, he went to the Italian front for a year. After the war ended, he returned to Prague. In 1938, he was contracted to be a structural engineer for the Czechoslovak Pavilion at the World's Fair in New York City in 1939 to 1940. After his previous experience in structural engineering of the Czechoslovak Pavilion at the World's Fair in Paris in 1937, which was an avant-garde building made of Czech glass and steel, materials that Czechoslovakia wanted to sell on the international market. With the growing danger of Nazi imperialism in Central Europe, Polivka decided in 1939 to use the project of a Czechoslovak pavilion at the World's Fair in New York City to emigrate to the United States. For a couple of months, he stayed on the East Coast, and in the fall 1939, uh, he was invited to give a talk at the University of California in Berkeley. Thanks to his success in the community of structuralist engineers there, and also thanks to a compatriot network of Czechoslovak immigrants in the San Francisco Bay Area, which grew stronger thanks to the Czechoslovak presentation and Czechoslovak presence at the Pacific-themed fair on Treasure Island in 1939 to 1940, he was able to stay. As all existing papers and publications mention, in 1946, Polivka became friends with Frank Lloyd Wright. Polivka wrote a reaction to Frank Lloyd Wright's comments, a comment published in a forum magazine regarding the lack of imagination among some engineers in relation to the falling water project. Polivka disapproved and, using the example of a spider web, tried to convince Wright that some engineers, such as, such as himself, actually do have imagination and do understand the principles of organic architecture. This caught Wright's attention and he replied laconically, quote, why don't you come see us at Taliesin West, end quote. The visit occurred on the beginning of May 1946, and they started designing three projects together, the Guggenheim Museum, Roger Lacey's Hotel in Dallas, and the tower addition to the Johnson Wax Company headquarters in Racine, Wisconsin, which we can see here. For the next 13 years, they continued to work on projects such as the Guggenheim Museum and the Butterfly Bay Bridge. More joint projects came up over the years, the Mile High Building in Illinois, the Belmont Racetrack Pavilion in New York City, and V.C. Morris, uh, Morris Cliff House in San Francisco, which you can see here. In addition, in my research on Polivka, I was able to identify two more joint projects. Polivka actually did some unspecified work on the V.C. Morris shop on Maiden Lane in San Francisco side, and also, he suggested that he and Wright work on a bridge over the Panama Canal in 1958. Uh, the bridge over the Panama Canal was funded by the United States government. The process of designing the Butterfly Bay Bridge between 1948 to 1957 has been very thoroughly described by Paul Venable Turner in his book, Frank Lloyd Wright and San Francisco. However, Aaron Green, Wright's official representative in the Bay Area is more highlighted there. Before he, before he brought this opportunity to Frank Lloyd Wright, Polivka came up with his own idea for the two crossings over the Bay. One of them was a multiplication of his 1940 Podolsko Bridge, which you can see here, designed right before he left Czechoslovakia. The other one was supposed to have an aluminum rotating middle piece allowing large cargo ships to pass. You can see it on the top of the, of the plan. Between 1948 to 1957, Polivka, Green and Wright worked on the project together. While Green did most of the, the in-person negotiations, Polivka took care of the calculations and the press promotion, 
and Wright provided the overall idea and, of course, his brand. There was another lesser known actor in this collaboration, P. Abea. Apparently, he was Frank Lloyd Wright's employee who created the core part of the Butterfly Bay Bridge model and brought it to Polivka in 1952 from Arizona. It was believed that the entire presentation model was built by Polivka with his students at Stanford University. In March 1952, the model became one of the reasons for a major conflict between Wright and Polivka, which paralyzed their relationships for almost, um, for almost two years. There were multiple reasons, one of which was typical, Wright owing Polivka money. But another one was a misunderstanding as to who owned the model of the Butterfly Bay Bridge, since the core was made by Abea et alias in West, but was then significantly enhanced, and there were pieces added to it, by Polivka and his students at Stanford. Furthermore, the completion of the model was sponsored by their common client, V.C. Morris. After this conflict, Wright did not speak to Polivka for almost two years, and even after that, the communication was never as warm as before. It definitely did not help that Aaron Green was not very thrilled with Polivka's relationship with Frank Lloyd Wright. He saw him as a threat and was literally telling on Polivka to Wright, defaming Polivka in the process. The work on the Butterfly Bay Bridge lasted almost 10 years and ended in 1957. Due to different approaches by the Bay Area municipalities on the traffic organization and the decision to connect the bay via a tunnel with what, which was, with what was later called the BART, Bay Area Rapid Transport, the idea of two more bridges didn't seem possible to Frank Lloyd Wright. So he used the design of the Butterfly Bay Bridge in his Baghdad project. Yaroslav Polivka learned about it the hard way from a reproduction in architectural record. And as his correspondence suggests, he could not have been more disappointed. He did not see the situation with the Bay Area crossings as hopelessly as Wright did. So he contacted Henry Tweet, a local engineer who was involved in designing the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. And they updated Polivka's original plans and connected them with the rather ecologically disastrous Cal Water Project. The Cal Water Project proposed that the water in the bay be desalinated by leading all freshwater streams in Central California to the bay and building a dam across the bay. In 1957, Frank Lloyd Wright came up with the idea of a mile high building, a gigantic macrostructure involving all city functions in one skyscraper. As described by Barry Bergdahl, Pepa Casineo and Ramon Graus, the project was a result of a respected friendship between Wright and Spanish engineer Eduardo Toroja. In the credits plate, Toroja and Polivka are not directly mentioned as, design, as engineers for this project, not even as collaborators, but rather under the title Salutations. As photographs suggest, Polivka was very proud of the fact that Wright listed his name in the project. However, we should look at it more as the climax of a nearly decade-long relationship between Wright, Toroja, and Polivka. The whole triangle revolved around another project, the publishing of Toroja's book, Philosophy of Structures in English, which was the main purpose of Toroja's several trips to the United States. In 1948, Polivka followed up after a personal meeting of Toroja and his Berkeley colleague, engineer Ramon e. Davis, in Europe the previous year. Supposedly it was in Paris in 1947. Toroja's shell concrete structure designs took Polivka's breath away and he got an idea. At the time, Toroja was unsuccessful in finding a publisher for his book project in which he would present his designs in a broader context of historical and contemporary architecture. This project took another 10 years. Polivka and Toroja exchanged thousands of letters and versions of single chapters and revisions. The project was constantly evolving. Polivka in, uh, involved his younger son Milos Polivka, who in the meantime became a researcher at UC Berkeley. In 1957, 
uh, sorry, in 1956, Polivka finally found a publisher, the University of California Press, and the book was published in 1958 as Philosophy of Structures, a title which was suggested by Polivka himself. In 1950, Polivka vaguely mentioned Toroha and his work to Frank Lloyd Wright. He reminded him once more in a letter and Wright finally invited Toroha to Taliesin West. It evolved into a much more important visit to the United States for Toroha. He attended an American Institute of Architects meeting in Los Angeles and gave a lecture at UC Berkeley, meeting again with Polivka's colleague, Raymond E. Davis, and he got to know Howard Eberhardt, another Polivka's colleague. Toroha was accompanied by his Spanish colleagues, Jamie Nadal and Francisco Lucini. Toroha made a grand, great impression on Wright, and they stayed in touch until Wright's death in 1959. On their trip, Toroha, Nadal, and Lucini met another person who became a key figure in the book project Philosophy of Structures, editor Elizabeth Kendall Thompson of the Architectural Record Western Edition and the significant architectural critic in San Francisco Bay Area. I'm very happy that we are going to hear a separate paper dedicated to her today, which only confirms her exceptional role in the Bay Area scene in the mid-century era. After Kendall Thompson met with Toroha and his colleagues in 1950, Polivka asked her to edit the manuscript and anglicize it, uh, because his translation from Spanish to English uh, wasn't uh, very, uh, very good. Uh, given that he was not a native English speaker. He was not very confident in it. Work on the manuscript progressed very slowly, as both Toroha and Polivka were constantly adding to and changing the manuscript. Kendall Thompson ran out of patience several times, and she let not only Polivka know, but also to Toroha, with whom she was in occasional direct contact as well. In the spring 1952, Toroha wrote to Polivka, as, quote, as I understood from the last letter from Mrs. Thompson, she is giving up her work on the translation, end quote. However, she did not give up the work, even though in the first half of the 1950s, she was raising her children and her role as a mother also determined her availability for Polivka and Toroha's project and her patience for repeatedly correcting the same passages that had been corrected over and over again. On January 4, 1954, for example, she wrote, quote, the manuscript arrived just over the holidays and I was too busy to do anything with it. Now the kids are back in school, so I can promise I'll get back to you within two weeks, end quote. Elizabeth Kendall Thompson was also trying to find a publisher for the book. Unfortunately, she was not successful. The answer from Dodge Publishing, whom she had contacted, was non-negotiable, quote, after careful and long consideration, we have decided that we cannot offer encouragement in the further development of this project. In short, we believe uh, that it would be difficult to hold the reader's attention through an entire book on such a subject. And we therefore believe that the proposed book would not be covered by very good sales, end quote. The real reason, however, was the fact that the Dodge Corporation was already working on another Toroha's book, the Structures of Eduardo Toroja, which was published shortly in 1958, and they wanted to be the first ones to present the Spanish designer to the United States audience. This goes back to Frank Lloyd Wright. When the work on the book was coming to the close in 1957, Polivka tried to find some authority that would write the preface. Naturally, he asked Frank Lloyd Wright first. Wright wrote a short concept more like a statement or a note for the preface, quote, we interested in engineering organic architecture in America have learned to keep a sharp lookout overseas for organic character in work of our contemporaries. We find it in France, in Italy, and now in Spain in the admirable work of Eduardo Toroja, end quote. Because Wright repeatedly did not react to Polivka's request, to submit the finalized preface, he asked another authority, Richard Neutra. Although Neutra did not submit the preface either, he later published a very positive review of the book 
a journal of the American Institute of Architects in 1958. Then Polivka moved, uh, then Polivka asked another friend he had in common with Frank Lloyd Wright, Bruno Zevi, but Zevi did not write the preface either. In the published book, we can find a preface written by Polivka himself, along with his son Milos. Although in late 1958, in their correspondence, Polivka mentions to write another opportunity to design a bridge over the Panama Canal together, no actual plan or design was discussed. Their last joint project was the race pavilion in Belmont Park, New York City from 1958. The design of the suspended structure of the roof was neither Wright's nor Polivka's idea, although he designed the execution. It was actually a result of two patent proposals from 1940s and 1950s, which Polivka was involved in together with Victor de Suvero and Paolo Celasi. During World War II, Polivka, who was strongly anti-Nazi because the Nazi regime in Czechoslovakia murdered the, the entire family of his wife, who was Jewish, during the war, he worked for Kaiser Industries at the Richmond docks to fight the Nazis. And it was during this time that Victor de Suvero, an Italian diplomat who worked in China in the 1930s, arrived in San Francisco and befriended Polivka. Apparently, de Suvero was also interested in construction design. Their warm friendship grew into a professional collaboration and Yaroslav Polivka started to prepare two patent applications with him. They were both very ambitious. The first of Polivka's and Disuvero's joint patent ideas from 1951 was a suspended construction system that would prevent deflections or at least minimize them significantly. In their patent proposal, they tried to apply their, their invention to the Golden Gate Bridge, which used to swing a lot in the wind at the time. And they wanted to prevent it from the, the unfortunate fate of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in the Seattle area that collapsed in 1940. The second one was a structural support system that was designed to prevent the leaning tower in Pisa, Italy, from further collapsing. In the second half of the 1950s, they both tried to promote their idea in Italy, for which de Suvero contacted Bruno Zevi and introduced him to Polivka. There already was a connection between Zevi and Frank Lloyd Wright. Their first exchange in the form of a letter is stored at Wright's archive at the Avery Library in New York and is dated 1945. Zevi was a very active promoter of Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture in Italy. He published articles on him. He organized an exhibition in Milan of Frank Lloyd Wright's work. They exchanged Japanese prints and he supported the protest against demolishing the Robbie House in 1957. Zevi also visited Taliesin West during the same period of time when Polivka was a frequent guest there. However, Zevi and Polivka never met in person, but Polivka apparently made a great impression on Zevi. Zevi was supposed to do uh, the Italian promotion of their proposal to make the Leaning Tower of Pisa structure more stable, uh, which he was unsuccessful with. But he not, nonetheless published De Suvero's article on Polivka in the magazine L'Architectura, of which he was the editor-in-chief at the time. In 1940, the same year when Polivka met De Suvero, Polivka met another Italian, structural engineer Paolo Celasi. Chalazi also moved to China in the 1930s to get a prospective job during the intense building activities in China at the time. He related to Polivka that as, as an Italian citizen, he was captured right after the Japanese occupation of Shanghai and imprisoned for espionage in a Japanese concentration camp. After he was released in 1945, he asked Polivka to help him in any way he could to get a job at UC Berkeley a position of a, quote, janitor or anything above, end quote. Yaroslav Polivka came up with, uh, an, uh, with other plans for Chalazi. Immediately, they followed up the original idea from 1941. Polivka applied for a patent for a system of suspended arches, which were originally designed 
for the United States Army for mobile aircraft hangars. In 1941, they did not succeed. After the war, they tried again. This time, the usage of their new patent was much broader, basically for any type of building. The patent was approved 13 years later, on June 24, 1958. However, it did not, it did not see any serial production or industrializ industrialization and did not meet Chalazis and Polivka's expectations to become incredibly wealthy. However, around the same time, Polivka found a different use for their invention. He combined the anti-swinging suspension structure he co-designed with De Suvero with the principle of the suspended arches system. He co-invented co with Chalazi and came up with the design of a suspended roof of the Belmont Racetrack Pavilion he worked on with Frank Lloyd Wright in 1958. He saw the project as very promising and recommended his two sons, Miloš, who was a researcher and lecturer at UC Berkeley, and Jan, who was a structural engineer in the state of New York, uh, to Frank Lloyd Wright to participate in the construction. And also Jan was supposed to oversee the construction itself. However, after Wright's passing the next year, the project was completely abandoned and redesigned. The benefits of Polivka and Wright's relationship was not one-sided. Not only did Wright benefit from the collaborators and promoters that Polivka brought to him, but Polivka also benefited from knowing Wright and his collaborators and circles. Polivka was not just using Wright's name to promote his own accomplishments. He got to know collaborators with whom he forged new paths. Immediately after coming to Taliesin West in 1946, he befriended Frederick, Frederick Langhorst, who later asked Polivka to consult on a structural design for his own house in Berkeley at Brunel Drive. A few years later, in 1948, a group of young architects, William Patrick, Celestin Wisniewski, Sean O'Hare, and Anthony Capuccilli, completed the program of Wright's Fellowship and moved to the San Francisco Bay Area. They already knew Polivka, who was a frequent guest at Taliesin West at the time, so they contacted him since he was a respected authority in the area. The house for William Patrick in the Redwood City Heights became their joint project, where they wanted to experiment with some structural inventions. Using Wright's scheme of the Usonian house with an open living room, a tree growing in the middle of the floor plan, and small bedrooms aligned next to each other, Polivka revived the idea of Wright's textile blocks experiments from the 1920s and came, up, and came up with his own version. Polivka's blocks consisted of two layers that could be filled with any material, wooden plate, glass, or concrete filling. The young architects, together with a 60-year-old Polivka, came up with a perfect synthesis of Wrightian features, confirming that Wright was their major inspiration and influence. Since the Mid Glen House, as they called the project, became a centerpiece of Polivka's own presentation of his retrospective in 1955 at the gallery at Stanford University, we can assume that he considered his, this project as important as the Butterfly Bay Bridge, which was also highlighted there. Polivka also befriended other members of the Taliesin Fellowship. According to his letters from Taliesin West, his closest collaborator was John Ottenheimer. He also often communicated with Eugene Messeling, and there are several letters between Polivka and William Wesley Peters, who worked as the designated designer and manager for the Guggenheim project. Polivka also befriended John Ho. There is one personal letter from Ho to in Polivka's collection at University at Buffalo. We can't really say if these relationships would have worked outside of Wright's influence and his gravitational field, because Yaroslav Polivka passed away very shortly after Frank Lloyd Wright. He passed only a couple of months after Frank Lloyd Wright's passing in April 1959. In this paper, I wanted to show how the social metrics that Yaroslav Polivka brought with him to Frank Lloyd Wright 
was interconnected and how it was essential for the Wright's most significant projects in the 1950s. Olivka and his colleagues also benefited from his connection with Frank Lloyd Wright. Two strategies that became essential for modern architects seem to be relevant here. Firstly, applying for patents as a tool to ensure the uniqueness, originality, and seal their authorship. And secondly, creating relationships with editors, critics, and journalists, and making sure that the press will be extensive and positive, and therefore ensuring that the public opinion will be on their side. Polivka's bet on the patent system was unsuccessful, as was Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright's, but they were both correct about the power of mass media. In his later article, which was titled, Am I an Architect? Written originally for the Italian magazine Architectura, Polivka argues that he considered himself more, uh, both an engineer and an architect, and that he didn't really see the distinction between the two professions, since both were supposed to come up with creative and innovative solutions and forms for the built environment. As shown in the examples employed, Polivka's role in various projects had to be renegotiated each time, and each time had a slightly different nature. He was an engineer who did the calculations, but he was also an organizer, manager, negotiator, promoter, writer, and an editor. And he invited others into what was rather a closed and exclusive fellowship, such was Frank Lloyd Wright's circle. By revealing the silent collaborators, administrators, managers, promoters, draftsmen and draftswomen, modelers, assistants, and numerous others, such as Polivka, Toroha, Chelazi, De Suvero, Zevi, or Kendall Thompson, as well as showing the three-dimensional links and dynamics of these relationships and motivations behind them, we create a historically more accurate image of what it means to be an architect. Architectural history came up with this idea of the myth of the architect, which was never true, because we've learned that in architecture, great things can only be achieved collaboratively and collectively. Thank you.